So friends, grab your favorite beverage and join with me going through our readings on the 11th Sunday in Ordinary Time. To begin our readings, let us turn to our loving Father and pray. O God, strength of those who hope in you, graciously hear our pleas, and since without you, mortal frailty can do nothing, grant us always the help of your grace, that in following your commands, we may please you by our resolve and our deeds. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Friends, I always take that uh, prayer from the very opening uh, prayer of the Holy Mass, 11th Sunday. Well, our first reading is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 19, verses 2 to 6, then the psalm, Psalm 100, and then we have a second reading taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verses 6 to 11, then the Gospel, Matthew, chapter 9, verses 36 to chapter 10 and verse 8. All right, friends, like when you look at this beautiful week, the 11th Sunday in ordinary time for year A, continues the church's journey through the Gospel of Matthew. So here we come into Matthew at the end of Matthew chapter 9 and Matthew chapter 10. So with the famous mission discourse of Jesus, which he gives to the disciples, the twelve, as he sends them out for the first time on a mission of proclaiming the kingdom of God. So the readings going to begin with the prelude to the discourse in uh, chapter 9, verse 36, and then it is going to go down all the way to chapter 10, verses 8. So, let us read that together. <clears throat> when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore, the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirit to cast them out and to heal every disease and every infirmity. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaan, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, charging them, Go, Nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of those sheep house of Israel, and preach as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without pay, give without pay. Friends, several things are worth noticing here about this passage. The first one is that the mission discourse of Jesus is prompted by his seeing the crowds helpless and harassed like sheep without a shepherd. This is a very important passage because it is an illusion to imagery that you will 
find in several of the prophets in the Old Testament. Ezekiel is one that comes to mind that describes the people of Israel like a flock of sheep who are supposed to be being led by their shepherds but who are in fact being abused by their shepherds or abused or hurt by their shepherds in the sense of their monies being taken from them. Their stuff is being stolen from them and they are not be, uh, being led to God precisely by the people who are supposed to lead them to God in the Old Testament, namely the priest in the temple. So friends, it is interesting that Jesus here sees the people in need of leadership and of course he himself will say elsewhere. He will speak of himself as a shepherd. Like later in the gospel, he will say, strike the shepherds and the sheep will be scattered in the garden of Gethsemane. Then again in the gospel of John, he will say, I am the good shepherd. But in this case, Jesus appoints the twelve in response to this need for leadership among the people of Israel. That is, sees and compares to a flock of sheep in need of a shepherd. So that is the first thing to highlight here. And is that the people are going to need leadership. So to this day, at the risk of getting ahead of myself, I will just point out this, that the bishops in the Catholic Church who are the successors of the apostles will often have the bishop's crook, the bishop's staff, which is a symbol symbolic of their identity as a shepherd. And it doesn't mean that Jesus isn't the shepherd. You can ask the question, who is the shepherd of the church? Is it the bishops or is it Christ? Well, the answer is both, right? Because they are shepherds who are sent by the one shepherd, the supreme shepherd who is, of course, Christ himself. So that is the first imagery point there. And then the second image is this image of the harvest being plentiful, but the laborers being few. So here is the image shifts. Now it is not the flock of sheep in need of <coughs> shepherd. It is a harvest in need of laborers, in need of harvesters, in need of reapers to go out and harvest the fruit of the field, harvest the grain of wheat. And so in that context, the need for the harvest to take place. Jesus calls the twelve to him and he sets them apart from his other followers and gives them authority. The very interesting word, important word, the Greek word here is excusia, excusia. And it can also be translated as power. So in the same word that is used to describe Jesus' teaching earlier in the Gospel of Matthew at the end of the Sermon of Mount, when the people say, He taught as one having authority. Or he, or he taught with power. There was a power in his word, an authority in his words. Well, the very authority that Jesus himself possesses when he speaks the Sermon on the Mount. And he then gives to Matthew and Thomas and Andrew and James and John and Judas the Twelve, who are chosen to be his emissaries, chosen to act as shepherds on behalf of him as the messianic shepherd of God in leading the people into the kingdom of God. So the 
the 12 apostles are not just Jesus' closest friends. They are not just the followers that were particularly intimate with him and close to him amongst the multitude. No. He gives them excusia, authority, power. They have a share in his own authority and it is through that excusia, the power, through that authority that they are able not just to proclaim the kingdom of God, but to shepherd people into it, to go out and harvest, so to speak, to participate in the harvest of souls that Jesus is calling for with the coming of the kingdom. So, so this is the first co-missioning of the twelve. And we could go into all kinds of interesting studies of each of these figures of the two apostles. But for our purpose here, I would just want to highlight something about the list. That is particularly to the, uh, uh, the list of the apostles in the New Testament. Friends, every time you will get a list of the apostles' names in the gospel, uh, there are a couple of variations between the names between Gospels because as we have seen elsewhere, Jesus will, uh, Jews will often have more than one name. So that is not a big deal. But the point that is interesting is Simon Peter is always listed first. And Judas Iscariot is always listed last. So friends, there is a hierarchy within the list itself that points to Peter's role as the chief representative of the twelve and effectively the leader of the twelve apostles. And of course, it points to Judas' role, his ignominious role as the traitor among the twelve who will eventually be replaced by Matthias in the book of Acts in order to reconfigure uh, the number to fill the number of the twelve representing the twelve tribes of Israel which is the next point I want to make. Why twelve? Well friends, if you know anything about the Old Testament that there are twelve sons of Jacob and twelve tribes of Israel in the book of Exodus at the time of Moses. So the number 12 is the constitutive number for the people of Israel. So when you see the number 12, think 12 tribes of Israel. Think people of Israel. So when Jesus chooses the 12 to be his 12 students and give them authority, in the first century Jewish context, this is very important. It would imply that Jesus isn't just the long-awaited Messiah or the long-awaited King of Israel. It is also implies that Jesus is constituting around himself a new Israel with new tribal leaders, new patriarchs whose excusa or whose authority is not going to flow from their blood lineage with relationship to Jacob, you know. Are you descended from one of the sons of Jacob's? But rather, will flow from their relationship to Jesus, who has now given them an excusia. That is authority that is independent of their genealogy. So in fact, sometime the people ask, uh, um, um, Father, have you have you ever looked into each 12 apostles, whether they are descended from one of the 12 tribes? So there is, in a way, like looking for bloodline uh, descent. And I, I understand the inclination. It would be really cool if each apostle was from one of the 12 tribes of Israel. But I actually think the fact they are not. Because, I mean... There are several pairs of brothers, or at least a couple of pairs of brothers, Peter and Andrew being obvious example. So there is no 
indication that they are descended from each of the 12 tribes. And that is actually might be the point to show that in the new Israel that Jesus is constituting around himself what is going to matter is not the blood of Jacob but the blood of Christ because it is going to be the same or these same twelve who later in the gospel of Matthew Jesus gathers around himself and gives his blood under the appearance of wine and his body under the appearance of bread and will say to them you twelve will sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel so friends they are connected to the twelve tribes but it is not genealogically like the Old Testament it is eschatologically through the new covenant so again something to think about the church isn't just an institution it is the new people of Israel it is the new constitution so to speak of Israel around Christ and the twelve are at the head of it so they are the font of it and they are the shape of it just like the twelve sons of Jacob were the constitutive body uh, uh, for the people of Israel. So, what about the mission? So, Jesus sends these twelve out and he charges them. Look at the beautiful words. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of Samaritans. Wow! Okay? So, Jesus doesn't like <laughs> Gentiles and he doesn't like Samaritan apparently, right? No, that's not the case. Wrong. All the people can understandably be a little confused uh, by and even maybe a little scandalized by that particular passage. It is very easily explained when we recall that there is an order to the mission of the gospel. For example, if when we recall that there is an order to the mission of gospel look at when you read St. Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 1 Paul will talk about the fact that in God's plan of salvation there is a certain order can be summarized as follows to the Jews first then also the Greek right so in bringing the good news of salvation the apostles are going to be commissioned not to go into the uh, earth proclaiming the gospel to all nations there will be that that will be after the resurrection but during the ministry of Jesus they are going to be a focus first and foremost on the lost sheep of the house of Israel so it would be uh, unfitting to pass over the chosen people of God to start bringing the message to the Gentiles and the Samaritans before you have even brought it to the people of the Messiah himself, namely the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel, the descendants of Jacob. And so when he says, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he's effectively giving them an evangelical order, meaning the order in which the gospel is preached that will continue in the early church and you will see this over and over again for example in the book of Acts when St. Paul brings the gospel to a new city he goes first to the synagogue and then the synagogue from the synagogue he goes out to the Gentiles so the same thing is true during the apostolic mission during Jesus' earthly life the apostle will be sent first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and then after the resurrection they will be sent out to the nations to the Jews first and then also to the Greek and once they are sent out what is their main message? the kingdom of heaven is at hand so they are going to re 
encapsulate the same message that Jesus was doing early in the Gospel of Matthew. So when Jesus goes out, one of the first words out of his mouth is repent for the kingdom of God, uh, for, the, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then he heals the sick, he raises the dead, he cleanses the lepers, he casts out demons. So the apostles here are emissaries of Christ insofar as they are going to say the same words that Jesus said and do the same things that Jesus did. They will be, as we uh, used today when speaking of priests and Alta Christus, another Christ, is precisely their role in carrying out their apostolic mission. They are not sent out to say anything or do anything that Jesus himself didn't already do or say, but rather to bring the good news, both the oral good news and also the good news of the miracles that they are performing out into the, the people of Israel among the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so the prophets and the words of the prophets might see their fulfillment, first and foremost, with the Israelites themselves. All right, friends, so that's just a little overview here for the, uh, here of the mission uh, discourse. A very powerful. And I would encourage you, if you think about this passage, to go and take a peek at the book of Acts. And if you want to see this, it is fascinating. So read through the Acts of the Apostles with the life of Jesus in mind. And one of the things you will notice is Peter and Paul will frequently do and say things that are parallel to what Jesus himself has said in the gospel. Literally, they are recapitulating in their own lives and mission the words and life of Christ. All right, friends, the, the Old Testament reading for today, the background is that it's very simple. It is just a passage from Exodus chapter 19. So if you had any doubts about the importance of the 12 tribes, just read the first reading for today because it is about the 12 tribes at the foot of Mount Sinai. And it says something very significant. It says, when they, meaning the 12 tribes, set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, encamped, they encamped in the wilderness and their Israel encamped before the mountain, it's mean before uh, Mount Sinai. And Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him out of the mountain saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my own possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. So, here's the key line. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Friends, what does that mean? It means that the 12 tribes are set apart not just to be God's chosen people, although they are, that not just to be a holy nation, although they are, that too, right? Holy means set apart. They are supposed to be a kingdom of priests, which means that their principal mission is to worship God. So Israel, in a sense, in the Old Testament, are supposed to be the liturgical leaders of the whole human race. Just like Israel is the firstborn son, God says, and the rest of the nations are his younger children. 
So Israel is the kingdom of priests who are meant to lead other nations of the world into the worship of the one true God. Friends, just like there are 12 tribes that are a kingdom of priests in the Old Testament, so too in the New Testament. Jesus is going to choose the 12 apostles to be the new priest of the new covenant. So the Old Testament and the New Testament here, although Jesus doesn't use the word priest in the, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 10, imp implicitly by making them the 12 leaders of the 12 tribes of the new Israel and giving them exclusive power, authority. He's effectively preparing them to become the priest of the new covenant, which they will fulfill, uh, for they will fully enter into, of course, at the Last Supper, when he commands them to offer the sacrifice of the new covenant, which is the body and his blood. All right, friends, the, the response to Psalm for today, Psalm 100, is a very simple bridge between the Old Testament because it uses the imagery in verse 3 of being the flock of God, the people of God who are the flock of God. So it continues this imagery of God as a shepherd and his people as flock. And friends, Today, I will close with a line from the living tradition here. In his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, St. Thomas Aquinas, the great um, common doctor of the church and the great medieval commentator on scripture, has this to say about the imagery of the twelve and the relationship between the mission of the twelve and the Gentiles. He write these words. Why does it say 12? That is, conformity of the New and the Old Testament might be shown because in the Old Testament were 12 patriarchs and these are likewise 12. And then he says, and why does he say, do not go, to, go into the way of, uh, way of Gentiles? One should say that they were sent to both because first they were sent to the Jews wishing to lead the faithful into the faith of the fathers and he wished first that the faith should be preached to the Jews. So friends, there we see very clearly everything I just told you. St. Thomas already anticipated this. The reason there are 12 apostles in the New Testament is because there were 12 patriarchs in the Old, Test Old Testament. And the reason Jesus says don't go among the Gentiles is not because Gentiles have been rejected for salvation, but because in the order of salvation, the apostles are going to be sent first to the tribes of Israel and then to the nations so that the gospel might spread from Jesus to the apostle to the ends of the earth. Friends, what a powerful message that we have, especially as we honor and remember our fathers, because fatherhood is very important, head of the family. So father has the sole responsibility to lead the family, guide the family. Just like the priest, the spiritual father, the bishops, the spiritual shepherds are supposed to lead the people of God, so the earthly fathers, biological fathers, spiritual fathers, we all are called to lead the people to the kingdom of God. While I wish all the fathers happy Father's Day, may the blessing of the Almighty God be upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus loves you all. See you on Sunday.